Hope everybody's doing well. I want to welcome everybody to the Unimpressed Podcast. And we have a guest calling in from Houston, Texas, and his name is Daniel Gill. He is a seven-time champion, I guess, on American Ninja Warrior, uh, works in the ministry, and, and tries to help out a lot of people. So welcome to the show, Daniel. How are you doing today? Yeah, doing well, John. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure being with you today. Yeah, I was reading a little bit about you and, you know, interesting path. And did you ever think that you would be doing this America Ninja Warrior show? No, nah, man. No, definitely not. I mean, I grew up in Houston, Texas, so there's already millions of people out here. And, you know, my, my parents chose to homeschool all five of the kids. So I'm one of five. And, you know, we weren't quite, didn't have the same upbringing and experiences as other people. And so I, I loved watching TV, loved watching Ninja Warrior as I was growing up. But I was like, nah, there's never any any possibility of me doing anything like that. They don't film TV shows here in Houston. And, you know, I've been an athlete, but how would I even go about doing that? And then, you know, just by, by happenstance or miraculous means, a friend of mine at, when I was 19 years old told me about a local gym that trained people for the show, went there, was able to get a job, started training and then applied. And after two years of rejection, finally got my shot on season seven back in 2015 made my mark rookie of the year and then it's just been riding that wave and staying consistent and faithful to the trade uh, for about a decade now wow wow so once you get in the system if you do well you stay in the system not necessarily i mean nothing's guaranteed especially when it comes to reality television However, if, if you do well, or if you've got an incredible story, or if you, you reach a certain fan base, then you're more likely to get an opportunity to come back. Now, I say that, but I still have to audition every single year. I have to fill out a new application, submit a new audition video, and then go through the rounds of, of getting selected. So nothing's guaranteed, but you do set yourself up with a higher possibility of getting brought back if you do well. <laughs> Interesting. Now I want to ask Arthur. I'm mean, like Arthur, man. Why you got making these guys reapply every t <laughs> every time? That's a little mundane, you think? Because you're bringing in viewers. Obviously, if they've booked you this many times, obviously you've got some following, and yeah. and people like you on the show. It's interesting that they would make you go through the whole process over again. So is this like just a? This is basically your career outside of the other things you do. Yeah. And, and that's what I think the coolest part about it is, you know, the, the show is amazing. It's been a wonderful opportunity each and every year that I've been able to go out there, showcase my ability, showcase my, my talents, my just well, the training, the hard work that I put into it, because I like so many others that compete at the, the highest level on the show. I mean, we're basically full time professional level athletes dedicating the time, the training, the the diet, all of those things go into being the best athlete possible in order to beat the the world's toughest obstacle course the first time because what you see on tv is the first time we touch like any of those courses which is so so difficult but what the show has given me over the years is a platform you know i'm now a full-time motivational speaker traveling i mean we just finished summer so we've i've had the busiest summer i've had yet traveling speaking at summer camps uh youth camps of all kind you know speaking at uh now getting back into schools, whether public or private, and talking about overcoming obstacles, sharing my journey, my adventures, uh, you know, facing disappointment, struggles, even just like a holistic mindset. And so the the show has given me a platform to then monetize the celebrity status that I've acquired through this reality television. It's very niche you know, competition, but it's been awesome. You know, people think that just being on the show is, you know, you make a ton of money, but really you don't i mean you oftentimes take off work from your normal job to go and compete for these you know few weeks that they film each and every year and unless you win the whole million you don't really make any money from there but you get to be on this tv show and you have an opportunity to then leverage that publicity to then do other things create other content books resources you know curriculums of various kinds so yeah the, the show's been an amazing launching platform i'll keep doing it as long as i can but I've got a bunch of things I do outside of the TV show, including, you know, coaching, competing at national competitions that aren't televised yet. And uh, like I said, speaking and, and doing all that stuff. So it's been awesome. Now, who is Daniel? I mean, you know, when you think about this, I've always said that, too. I developed a, probably about a thousand shows and sold three. 
and just realize that, you know, it's a tough business. If you do get opportunity to be on one of these shows, it's an info commercial for the rest of your business or whatever you do. And I saw you homeschooled as a kid. Now, are you Native American? No, half Colombian, so South American. Colombian. My dad's Columbia. side. Of my nice. Now are you indigenous? I want to say yes. I mean, he's got like a whole town related to him back there and even did, did like the ancestry DNA recently. And apparently I'm like Afro-Colombian. So even like African heritage through my dad's bloodlines. So I'm like, wow, okay, awesome. But yeah, no, he was born and raised out there literally like on the Amazon River there in, in Colombia. But I, you know, my mom is, is white. <laughs> so like German, Scotch, Irish, she grown up native Texan girl. So they yeah. got married in college, had a bunch of kids. And so we'll go to Colombia every few years to, to visit. And it is just, it's, it's so cool to have that culture, that heritage. And just, I mean, the Hispanic community, I mean, we're so tight knit, so, so close. And it's awesome to have uh, so much um, that makes me who I am, you know? Yeah. Well, I've always said that, you know, even Italians, Colombians, uh, Mexicans. And I think a lot of people claim to be Colombian, claim to be Mexican, but I think, you know, and claim to be Italian. And, and I think a lot of these people are indigenous natives, natives to the world, salt to the earth type of people, because that's kind of my space. I'm a, a clairsentient. I had Cherokee Indian on both sides of my family. Thinking about that and you homeschooling, was your dad somewhat of a naturalist? And, and you know, what was his beliefs of, of as far as raising the kids? Yes, in parts. I mean, honestly, like you, you compare like his upbringing to my upbringing here in the States in America, everything from the food to, to the mindset to just the day to day life. It was very different. And so when my parents made the decision to homeschool us as kids, it's not that they had anything against their own upbringing. Really, I, and I remember having a conversation with my mother as I got older. She said, I don't regret the upbringing that we had, at, like her and my dad. She said, but we wanted to spend more time with you guys. We wanted to, to be able to, to pick up and go places to do certain things, but also to invest individually in the needs and the talents of each of our, our children. We don't just want a, a generalized education for all of them. We want a, a specific upbringing for them. So, I mean, we were involved in so many different environments and different, you know, extracurricular activities uh, based on one, just the, the desires or even the, the talents of myself and my siblings. So I was the athlete growing up, played about every sport possible. We got into like singing and dancing and performing at a young age. And so I, I discovered that I, I came alive in the lights. I love, you know, the, the production side of, um, you know, being a, a performer. So everything from memorizing lines, memorizing songs, like memorizing dance moves and things like that. And so the, the upbringing that I had helped prepare me, I think, in so many ways for the life that I'm living now, especially as it pertains to American Ninja Warriors, one part athletic competition. I was an athlete. But the other part, you know, reality television, production, they're there to film a TV show. What you see on TV of us running those courses is like 15% of what goes into it with all the interviews, B-roll footage, hero shots, uh, all the interaction, you know, overline and, and emails and phone calls with the producers getting everything set up and squared away. So there's a lot that goes into it. But my parents had this kind of holistic mentality where they said, yeah, we want to have more of a say in our children's upbringing than just your average family and nothing against mm -hmm. that. They just wanted a more hands-on approach. And I do think part of that might've come from my dad's upbringing, but I know a lot of it specifically came from my mother. She said, I want more for you guys. I want a greater say in what you're exposed to and when, or to be the exposure that you have to everything else in the world and to give you our worldview and just our knowledge of those things. Because I mean, you're gonna learn things just living life, just being on this planet. You're gonna learn things at different rates and they wanted to have a little bit more intentionality. So grateful for it. And my wife and I, once, once we start our family, plan on, on having a similar type of upbringing and homeschooling all of our kids. Well, I do believe that your best education in the world is meeting multiple types of people in multiple environments. You know, yeah. do, do you think your outlook is different being homeschooled compared to, say, some kids your age that weren't homeschooled? Very much so, especially during my high school years when I got opportunities through even like uh, the different 
the churches that I was a part of to go out and do like world missions and humanitarian works in places like yeah, Bulgaria or Honduras and just exposing yourself to other cultures in, in a safe environment with people that, you know, are leaders that are there to, to care for you and to help guide you and teach you. Uh, it was awesome. I absolutely loved it. And just, I would say I wouldn't be the man that I am today without the, the teachers and even like the coaches that I had that helped shape my outlook on life. Like, yeah, we work hard. Yes, it takes discipline and trying and failing at something before you begin to succeed. You're not going to be naturally gifted in every area of life. But when you fall and fail, what are you going to do? Like, are you just going to call it quits and give up? Well, guess what? You can't really do that when you're young. You're going to literally stunt your growth and what you're capable of. But if you can begin to, from a young age, based on like the, the teachers, the coaches, and the parents that you have, begin to reinforce a mindset that says, yeah, we live in a world where I will fall and fail. I will make mistakes, but that doesn't mean I shouldn't try. That just means I need to learn from those things, uh, not repeat them, and apply them to everything else that I'm doing in life. And so as long as you learn, you can make a lot of mistakes in life, like we will already. But if you can bulletproof your mindset at a young age to say, yeah, no matter what happens, I'm not going to quit or give up. I'm going to continue putting one foot in front of the other, stay faithful to the, the craft, stay disciplined in, in developing the tools of the trade, so to speak. I will begin to see success. So that was kind of the upbringing that I had. And I'll be the first to say I'm not perfect in any ways. I made a lot yeah. of mistakes. My wife would tell you that, but uh, I try to learn and grow always, whether as an athlete, entrepreneur, or whatever the case may be. Well, I, I talk about some of these subjects a lot, you know, because I always say this on my podcast and I go here about programming, you know, and people, people don't realize that their subconscious, you know, when we're born, they obviously they bring lineage to the table. And when they're born, they, the subconscious is being programmed on whatever your experiences you are having. And based on those experiences, you get to a certain point in life, you start responding to things with your unconscious bias based on that programming. Now, if that programming is not great, right, it, it sometimes that could hinder someone to get to consciousness. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's good to help people understand that and just kind of hear the freshness in your voice, the, the great attitude, positivity. Now, what did mom and dad do while you were kids? Yeah. So my mom I had a degree in like finance. She was like a, not an auditor. She was at one point, she was a realtor for a number of years before that. I think she was, what did she got her degree in crunch numbers basically. But once she started having a bunch of kids, she just said, I want to be a full-time mom. I want to devote my time, energy efforts into raising these children to be a benefit to society that we live in. And so, you know, growing up, my mom didn't do any of the, the business things that she did prior to having us, didn't use her degree other than to have a mindset to, to know how to help her kids, how to help the finances of her own family. But she was stay at home mom. My dad had two full time jobs. And I, I'm so grateful for the sacrifices that he made. It made it really hard growing up because he was he was always working. But the older that I got, the more I understood like, hey, if you have five kids, you, you need to be able to provide for them. You need to do what it takes to make sure that there's food on the table. So he had an oil and gas job, you know, crunching numbers um, at a local you know, oil and gas here in Houston because it's very popular to do that. But then his passion was soccer. He used to be a professional soccer player in Colombia. That's how he came to America in the first place and met my, my mom. So, uh, but three knee surgeries later, he couldn't, couldn't play pro anymore. So started a, a soccer club for about 20 plus years. He was a part of that club. So it was like nine to five, he was doing oil and gas. And then like seven to nine, he was coaching soccer with whether clubs uh, or club sports or with his teams. And so I, I didn't see as much of, of, of him as I wanted to, but I, I, I learned from a young age, like sacrifice is necessary, especially to those that we love and care about the most. And so, yeah, we see dad early mornings and, and evenings and then weekends, but the day-to-day -day grind was, you know, my mom staying at home and, and raising those five kids and, you know, they, they made it work. And I'm so, so grateful, the old, especially the older I get to realize how much they truly invested in, uh, you know, their family, their kids. Now, I know, I know you do the ministry stuff and, and your dad being from where he, he's from. And yeah. I grew up in a in a Baptist church, mm -hmm. and I having native on both sides, and having some type of being a natural healer kind of makes you think about things a lot. And thinking yeah. about your dad, I mean, I even get Sanaga eye drops 
from the Amazon, uh, from the Matias tribe, I think it's Matias tribe, to cleanse my pineal gland. And, you know, things like that is kind of some of the beliefs I have. Now, how did how does spirituality translate for your dad being from the Amazon to America? And what does your spirituality look like? Yeah, yeah. And, and honestly, on that topic, my, my parents, when they, they, be, they met, both of them had very different, you know, um, backgrounds when it came to, to faith and the role that it played in their day to day lives. In briefly, my, my mom grew up Southern Baptist here at a small, tiny church in, you know, Bay City, Texas, down south. And, you know, she grew up, you know, believed in the Lord, gave her life to the Lord. But then the church, like, unfortunately, very oftentimes happen. There's, it's built up of broken people that yes, forgiven and saved, but still fully capable of making mistakes and blowing it in life. So there was a church split that happened in her home church when she was a child. Um, I think it was like an affair with the pastor or something like that. And so my mom was like, Hey, I still believe in you, God, but I'm not, I'm not so cool with, you know, your, your people right now. I'm realizing how flawed they are. So she had walked away from, from the church for a number of years and then whereas my dad grew up Roman Catholic in, in Colombia, so very strict, very staunch, very, you know, he was like an altar boy his whole life, but very, very religious mindset as far as like do's, don'ts, like God is in a box in a lot of ways. And so they, they met in uh, college, got married, and they were like, hey, like we both believe in God, like here we go, like we'll, we'll work it out. We have, both have a faith. But then it, once, you know, all the kids started being born, my mom came to this place and said, hey, we can't do this on our own. We need to, to shift our lives, change for the betterment of our family, of our kids. And so then they started going and bringing us to a, a local, I think it was like a, a contemporary Baptist church is what I was raised in for the most part. Read the Bible, believed the Bible, and just, you know, found faith uh, not on my own. Obviously, my parents and my, my pastors had a great, great um help with that, gave my heart to the Lord at a young age, but it was in my high school years where I took ownership and responsibility and said, Hey, I'm not just going to go to church because mom and dad expect that of me. If I'm truly going to call myself a, a Christian, a Christ follower, what does that mean? What does that look like? I'm going to take ownership of, of not just saying, yeah, I prayed a prayer one time and I believe I'm, I'm saved from, you know, eternal damnation. No, no, no. I'm going to give you my life, like the good, the bad, but also the ugly, my hopes and my dreams, but also my fears and my doubts, my insecurities. God, if you're real, then I'm truly going to do my best to uphold my end of a relationship, get in the Bible, spend time around, you know, the people of God, have mentors and leaders over me to teach me all of the, the things that I, I, I don't understand as I'm reading the word. And so my, my, the household that I live in now, or the family that I live in, with and the the upbringing that we had was not one of like staunch religious formalities and and you know checking the boxes of do this do that no it was more like hey we we believe in god and we know that we're flawed even though forgiven we're going to do the best that we can with what we have and trust in the word that we have because of this thing for that's been here the bible for thousands and thousands of years without any inconsistencies especially when you dig deep and and really see that you know the things that supposedly are incoherent, don't don't mesh. They, they really do. When you look at it and you peel back the layers, you even look at the Hebrew language and how it was written, it blows my mind. The more that I study, the more real it becomes to me. And so both my parents are still very much involved in the role that our faith plays in our lives. And literally the, the man that I am is based upon the the faith that I have in my walk with the Lord each and every day. Well, the only yeah. thing the only thing in the Bible that's not in there is the uh, Catholic Church took out after death part. And I don't know why they did that. But yeah, wow. I mean, I agree. I mean, the threads are very, uh, a very similar narrative, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm the type of person too. I mean, I, there's multiple religions out there, but I yes. think, you know, when you take, look, if religion is one thing, mm -hmm. right, and you, and you look at how things were structured, I think people took pieces of that idea and made it their own. But I think there's only one God up there. At the end of the day, uh, why why do you think that in you know the Spanish culture part of the world, why do you think the the Catholic Church is so prominent? Gosh, I wish I could say that I had the most educated and, and well thought out answer. I'll be the first to admit I, I I don't, and that's something that I'll I'll need to talk with even my father more about because. For him, I mean, he's still a very outspoken, you know, Catholic. He's like, yeah, I, I believe in God. I, I pray to God and I know God in a similar manner that you do, Daniel. But even when I brought it up, there are certain things that we disagree on as far as 
you know, the difference between, you know, Roman Catholics and what I would consider myself like a Protestant. Um, Oh, I guess I, I tell all my friends just like, uh, what is it, like free range Christian? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, so what denomination do you go to? I'm like, well, it, the church. That's I a good answer. That's a good. Yeah. I like that. I was like, the church I attend is a non denominational church, and for me, I read the Bible, apply it to my life, realizing that the the do's and the don'ts, these commands and regulations aren't there to hinder me or limit my life. They're there literally to, to protect me from the consequences of sleeping with another man's wife or putting anything or anyone else in the place of God, realizing they're just going to let me down. And all, all these commands are literally there for our benefit. And so when I think about other, other religions or other sects of Christianity, all these different denominations, I look at them, I, I try to take the good from them, but while spitting out, even the Bible talks about like, take the meat, but spit out the bones, so to speak. And so I, I try to learn from other faiths, really, under the umbrella of Christianity. And I think in Catholicism or Roman Catholic, in like other parts of the world, especially in, in Colombia, I think it just it was so popular when it was introduced and so easy to have as a as a, a another part of your daily life. Like, yeah, I have my work. I have my family, I have my, my mass that I go to. And that's it's it's nice, it's functional, it fits, and it's it's easy to do. And again, I'm not I'm not Catholic, I'm not a confessing Catholic, but I don't know how fulfilling that is compared to me as a free range Christian. I'm like I walk with the Lord each day. I'm I'm in the Word. I, I have, you know, a church that I go to, a place that I'm connected and involved, you know, serving there as you know, a greeter or a worship leader, using my gifts and my talents. Um and I, I've got friends that are Catholics that have that same heart for God that are like, oh yeah, I love the Lord with all my being. Just like Jesus said in things, Matthew 22, where he said, yeah, the greatest commandment, love God with everything, your heart, soul, mind, strength. And out of that love, then you can love your neighbor as yourself. But I think, you know, again, from just my own personal journey, these 30 years I've been on the planet, a lot of people find comfort in religion. Just do this, do this, show up, be a part, check the box, you're good but don't have as much of their heart connected or invested in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's even parables where Jesus said, you know, in the last days, you know, there's going to be people that stand before judgment and say, God, I did all this in your name. God, I, I, I did this. I did that. Laid hands on the sick, healed them, all these kinds of things, cast out demons. And God says, depart from me for I never, I never knew you. And I think for me, that's very sobering because I don't want my, my walk with God or being a professed Christian, Christ follower, to just be dependent on a list of do's and don'ts. No, I, I treat my relationship with the Lord the same I do my wife or my friends. I mm -hmm. communicate with them. I, I spend time learning their likes and dislikes. I try to apply that to my life. And praying for me is just talking with the Lord. God, here's what's on my heart. Here's my knees, my prayers. But Lord, what's on your heart today? And it's amazing how quickly different scriptures will pop up into my head or different phone calls will come. Friends will come by and I'm like, oh, oh Lord, okay, you're, you're bringing it. It's so interesting all the ways that I feel God is speaking and moving, maybe not audibly, but but speaking to our hearts, that still small voice. And sorry, you got me like all, all preachy mode now, but it's, it's very exciting. I love getting to, to talk and share about my faith because to me, it's the most real thing that I have in this life, more than an athlete, more than an entrepreneur, even more than my relationship with my wife. I said, babe, if my walk with the Lord isn't right, my relationship with you is going to be affected. And same thing with her. I said, babe, I, I want you to be so founded in, in what you say you believe that I'm not above that. Because if it mm -hmm. is truly, if he is the God of the universe, there is no greater goal than to try to do our best to to learn and understand and walk with that that good and loving God in the midst of a fallen, broken world where there is an enemy who kills, steals, and destroys on a daily basis. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you think about that structure, sometimes it, in those situations, it becomes more about the church than the person. And I think people get caught up in that, and then people don't relish anything. And if you look at, you know, the pattern of lives through history or society, you know, we give away a lot and we don't relish, you know, it's almost like we're checking the box and we're not really relishing anything. And it's interesting that you are taking a different tack, which I think is commendable to understand that because sometimes breaking that structure or going against the grain to some extent, people are very defensive about their religion, unfortunately, but you know. How much have you relished? If you're going to be defensive about your religion, how much have you relished for yourself? And, and how much have you retained for yourself, I think, is, is a big deal. So when you think about your path now, you've had success and you've got some other things going on. What is your passion? 
and what is your message moving forward? For me, the, the goal of my life, one is to love God well, to be known as someone who had a heart after the Lord and, and used every talent, every ability, and every opportunity to to point people to what I, who I do believe is like the, the reason we're on this planet in the first place. According to the Bible, we're created for His pleasure. And so I, I, I love being an athlete, but that's not where I find my identity. I love being an entrepreneur, creating you know books and content and resources, tools to help others live a holistic lifestyle. Yes, spiritually, but also physically in the, in the natural. I mean, I can't tell you how many Christian friends I have that, that don't care about their bodies, don't care about you know the fact that I, I believe we're already living an eternal life. The only question is the other side of that eternity, where is it going to be? And they're like, oh, yeah. I, I know my treasures are up in heaven, but here on this earth, I'm just going to put poison and toxins in my body and not care about it, not prepare myself for the works that I believe God has prepared for me here on this earth to, to make an impact, not just for me or my family, but for the hurting world around us. And so for me, I, I love the platform that I have. I'm honored to be able to, to live the life that I live, but I don't take it for granted. And I, I really do truly intend on using every single opportunity and every single gifting that I have to make an impact in this world. I mean, we just released a book a couple of weeks ago and it's a you know, it's a biography on my life, you know, Kingdom Ninja, a Warrior's Guide to, to Physical, Mental and Spiritual Health. And what it is, it's it's a biography of my life, being an athlete, just the mindsets that I have, you know, the training methods that I use. And whether you're an athlete or just a, a fan of the show or just not even an OCR, an obstacle course racing athlete, but just someone who wants to take care of their body, this book is an incredible tool and resource because in addition to just being a fun, easy read about my life, it also incorporates three different sections of the book, one being physical health and wellness, wherever you are on that spectrum, two being mental health and wellness, you know, how to bulletproof our minds in such a difficult and devastatingly painful world that we live in now, where you post the wrong thing on social media, you'll get banned, you'll get blacklisted, you'll get drugged through the mud and it'll ruin us. It'll, it will sit there. What does it take? 10 different, you know, positive things to block out one negative thing we hear in a day about ourselves. And so I, I have a lot written there on, on mental health and well-being. And then the spiritual side of it is, yeah, I, I do believe there is one God above all other gods and has a good plan. And I, for me, it is through the Bible because in all these other religions, it's all works based, you know, like as long as your good outweighs your bad, you can hope for, you know, forgiveness or you can hope for redemption. The problem is I, I know how easy it is to have a thought enter my mind that's unholy or not righteous. And I'm like, oh man, I could never do enough good if that's the if that's the case. But then specifically, exclusively in Christianity, it's where the hero of the story says, No, I'll I'll come down and I'll die for the villains. I will I will provide a way where there there is no way in and of themselves. And so for me, I see that and compare that to others. And I'm like, wow, okay, it's not that Christianity disagrees with these other religions, it's just providing for me what I see as the fullest answer of saying, Yeah, God in heaven says, You're not perfect, you'll never be. But I am, and so I'll provide a way for you to live, not just in heaven when you die, but every day on earth with my spirit inside of you, walking hand in hand with me through the good days and the bad days. Because anyone knows that if you go for, if you become a Christian for an easy life, you're setting yourself up for failure because we go through the valleys, the shadows of death, just like everybody else. But we don't yeah. have to fear because he's with us. I can relate to that. Going through what the spirituality I'm going through, being a clairsentient, I get rid of whatever weight I'm holding myself down, the more layers, the more sensitive I get. So it's kind of twofold. You're, you're going the right direction, but when you become more sensitive, you got to recognize that you're going to respond to things differently. It's almost like you're very poignant, you know? And I think that growth, like you said, going through whatever you have to go through. I mean, if you're really, truly going, really going through this process and it's real, I think you feel it. You know, and, and speaking to the book Kingdom Ninja, right? What was the part about the mind? What are you thinking about all the stuff we deal with? Because I yeah. think that's a big deal right now, you know, with people having to deal with the pandemic and, you know, and all these fear tactics are being put out in, in society. What is your take on protecting your mind in the book? Yeah. The shortest explanation that I could give briefly is just we've got so much coming into our mind through all of our senses on a daily basis. We need to make sure that we have time to sit, sift through, 
process that information, uh, celebrate the victories, but allow time to, to grieve and to mourn the losses and the difficulties. But in all of that, understand who we are in the midst of that, where we stand in the midst of that. So for me, practically, because I'm a very big practical guy, I journal. I'll, and I'm not talking like, okay, a high school girl sitting on her bed, like writing for hours and hours. No, no, no. I just, I keep it on my phone and I've got all these different folders in in an app that I've got. And I, I've got my thoughts on this topic. I jot down my thoughts on that topic. I've got one for the the, the experiences that I'm facing or the, the goals that I have. And for me, sitting down, taking the time, even if it's just five minutes, getting this stuff out of me helps give me a place to put it as opposed to it just bottling up in my heart, bottling up in my mind. And then the next, the next day I've got, I got more coming in. I've got more of just uh, this overwhelming or just overload of things coming in. And that's where I think we get burnt out. We get overwhelmed. We get stressed out to the max because we don't give ourselves time to sift and go through those things and organize them. I mean, for me, I also, I keep a gratitude journal because sometimes I wake up on the wrong side of the bed and I'm just like, it's a bad day. But for me, I'll, I'll sit up on those moments. And I'll say, okay, give me three to five minutes. Let me jot down a couple of things I'm thankful for. I'm grateful for that I have two hands to hold things. I'm grateful that I've got a bed to, to lay in. I'm grateful that I've got a family that as, you know, as imperfect as we are, and as much as we try to kill each other as kids, which was all on me, I said, I'm grateful that I have people that love me. And the, the shift that happens in my heart and in my mind literally changes everything. And again, then I look at, you know, biblically, it talks about, you know, in the New Testament, it says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is of good report, think about these things. And I do truly believe that they were onto something that God had his hand on the hand of the writers that wrote the Old and the New Testament to say, hey, here's my prescriptions on how you should live life. Not just because I want you to do this, but because of the effects that it will have on your life. And for me, journaling, having intentional conversations with people that I trust, not just casting my pearls before swine because we live in a world where gossip culture is huge. And if I tell you something, just hoping that you keep it to yourself, there's no guarantee that you don't go tell it to you know, 10, 15 other people. Next thing I know, my hardships are being broadcast to everybody. So I have people that keep me in check that aren't yes men, but they they test what I'm doing. They they push back against what I'm, I'm chasing after. They keep me accountable to the goals that I have. Even if I don't want to hear it, I make sure that I feel like God has brought people in my life to help me in that way. And that helps tremendously with, with my mental health. Have people that know my good, bad, and ugly. I don't have skeletons in my closet that are unbeknown to everybody else. My wife knows everything about me, for better and for worse. I've got mentors and leaders that call me up, call me up higher to, to the things that I feel like I'm called to do in life. And if we have people like that and we have a mindset that says, hey, I need to take five minutes and sit. I'm going to say no to this thing. I need to spend some me time. We need to do that as opposed to just grind, 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 go, 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 not give ourselves time to decompress. You know? Awesome. Awesome. Well, we need more positive people like you in the world. I mean, I love the... I love the intensity. It feels like you got a fire inside of you burning, pushing you. And if we want to find the book, where do we find the book? Yeah, I mean, honestly, anywhere books are sold, but you can go through. I think I've, I've got a web page, a landing page right now, which is kingdom-ninja.com, as well as they can, you can get it through any of my, my social media outlets, whether it's you know Instagram at Kingdom Ninja or Facebook. Twitter, all those ones. I've got my Linktree on there, which is Linktree Kingdom Ninja. It's got all my all my outlets, including my website, thekingdomninja.com. But it's been such a joy to create, you know, what I consider valuable, extremely valuable content that can help others. And again, that's the goal of what I want my life to do. I want my life to make an impact in the the areas that I have gifting, that I have a voice. I want to use that for good because I've been through those hurting those difficult, those struggling moments and still go through those. So to have something like that as a resource to, to help others, I, I I'm, couldn't be more happy about it. And I think it also makes a great gifts for athletes and fans of American Ninja Warrior because I get, I'll go through all the details of what it's like competing on the show because people think it's amazing, but it's really a lot of work and shockingly different than what you might imagine. <laughs> Nice, nice. Well, I think, Daniel, I don't know if there's anything else you want to cover. I think we covered a lot, and hopefully this interview is a little different than what you're used to, to try to educate some people on who you are and what your mission is and what you're trying to do. So is there anything else out there that we didn't touch on that you might want to touch on before we get off here? 
I mean, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, people can can watch the season. I've had a great, great run. Depending on when this airs, you'll see how my season 15 ended uh, here in just a matter of days so, or just a few days ago, depending on when you guys hear this podcast. But it's been such a joy. I will continue competing as long as I can. I mean, just turned 30 years old, and I feel like I, I'm getting the hang of how to how to train well, how to be, you know, uh, preventative for injuries and it's been amazing to be a full-time athlete but also stepping into a realm of being a full-time entrepreneur and speaker so yeah if anyone out there you know is interested in me coming out speaking at your school or your your church or your conference or camp or even keynote messages it's been such a joy to get to share my journey and adventures and just overcoming obstacles whether they take physical form or that's the 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 emotional obstacles that we face in life or even the mental obstacles a fear of stepping out or fear of of rejection you know that can that can stop us before we even get to the starting line oftentimes so i I love what i do i'm blessed to be doing what i'm doing and i will continue doing it as long as i can so again thank you so much john for having me on today awesome man awesome it's been a great interview and hope people like i said learn something from our conversation this is american ninja warrior daniel gill and i'm john edmonds cosma the ceo of bang productions Thank you.